Imagine getting arrested for having a child with a dead body. Jennifer Burroughs is a 26 year old who was working at a morgue when she was arrested after a DNA test proved her child's father was a dead body she was supposed to autopsy. But it actually gets worse from here because while Jennifer was working as an assistant pathologist at the morgue, she had relations with more than 60 bodies belonging to men aged 17 to 71 years old. She did this for two years until it led to the birth of her son. Her son's father was a 57 year old veterinarian from Texas who passed away in a car accident in 2017. Jennifer was charged with 158 counts of indecent treatment of a corpse. Many psychologists and experts have debated why someone would do this. The reasons range from curiosity to severe mental illness. Some even believe Jennifer was suffering from psychosis. Alright, after all that, I don't really know how to end this video, so stay safe out there and follow for more. Okay, I've been seeing this all over my For You page and I need to talk about it. <laughs> this can give you quite the jump scare if you're not expecting it. <laughs> This woman named Felicity gained tons of media attention in 2018 when she confessed to marrying a zombie doll named Kelly. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but in my opinion, Kelly is looking suspiciously real. Felicity's fascination with dolls came at a young age when her grandmother gifted her a porcelain doll. She became obsessed with collecting dolls over the years, and she grew a wide collection. Her collection ranged from antique dolls all the way to creepy dolls, but everything changed when she found a zombie doll online. Kelly the zombie doll was created by an artist in Thailand. Felicity became intrigued with the doll's unique features and then became obsessed with it. She began treating the doll like a human by giving her a name, dressing her up, and even taking her out. Felicity claims that Kelly has a personality and that they have a deep emotional connection. As time went on, Felicity's feelings grew stronger and she realized that Kelly was her soulmate. She decided to take the relationship to the next level and propose to the doll. She exchanged vows with the doll and promised to love and cherish her forever. Felicity insisted that this was a genuine expression of her love and devotion. She said that the doll has helped her through hard times and even given her a sense of purpose. Despite the controversy, Felicity remains committed to Kelly. I actually found that they recently started a family of zombie doll children. What a happy family, I guess. In reality, no disrespect to Felicity though, like you do you girl. If you love zombie dolls, then you do that. Did you know that Yellow Jackets is inspired by two true stories? The first one is the Donner Party. In April 1876, a group of about 87 people set out on a journey from Illinois to California. Instead of the Oregon Trail, they decided to use a shorter, untested route. By the time they were crossing the Sierra Nevada mountain range, they were low on food and supplies. And between the rough terrain and the accumulating snow, they were stranded by October. A diary kept by Patrick Breen detailed the weeks to come. As members of their party succumbed to the cold illness or starvation, they ended up resorting to cannibalism. When a search party arrived to help them in the spring of 1877, they found that over half the Donner Party had died, and as many as 21 had been eaten. After their rescue, the Donner Party survivors became famous, then infamous. And while some denied the cannibalism stories, at least eight survivors admitted to eating human flesh. Let me know if you guys want to hear the other story that inspired the show. This small Santa Claus was also Toronto's scariest serial killer. 67-year-old Bruce MacArthur murdered eight men in downtown Toronto from 2010 to 2018. He was previously married with a woman and had two children with her, but little did they know about his double life. Many people who knew Bruce described him as sweet and outgoing, and they never imagined he would do something like this. In 2010, gay men in Toronto began going missing, and unfortunately, after some time, their cases stopped getting so much attention. Bruce first met these men on day dating apps and when he met them in person, he took their lives. He targeted marginalized men, which in this case were gay men of color. He strangled them and then dismembered their bodies and then put their body parts in planters. Bruce even took photos of his victims when they were alive and then deceased. This is one of his victims who got away after almost being murdered by Bruce. In 2018, police began discovering dismembered body parts of some of the eight missing men on the property of one of Bruce's clients who hired him as a landscaper. And finally, in 2019, Bruce pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. This is why you have to be careful in national parks. So in 2016, a man completely dissolved in a hot spring in Yellowstone. A lot of people don't realize these hot springs are near boiling temperatures and a lot of them are severely acidic. And falling in happens more than we realize. It terrifies me so much that I made an entire podcast episode about it that's going up tonight. So it's believed that a 23 year old man and his sister went into Yellowstone to go hot potting, which is when people secretly hang out in the cooler hot springs, it's like really not allowed in the park. His sister was filming him as he went over to one of the hot springs to reach down and touch it to test the temperature, and that's when he tumbled forward and fell in. 
A rescue team was able to get there and they saw his body floating in the pool because a fall like that kills you immediately. But a thunderstorm was coming in so they were gonna have to wait a while to get him out. And by the time they got there, there was nothing left. And unfortunately, this does happen more than we realize. Check out tonight's episode if you're interested in hearing more. So I always thought no one ever dies at Disney. Like even if something horrible happens, they get the person off the park so they can always say that no one's ever died there. But then I found out not only is that not true, but a law firm has compiled all of the incidents. I'm going to share a few of them with you, but if you're interested in stories like this, make sure you follow the podcast because tonight's episode's just going to be these stories. So two of the park's worst accidents have both happened on the Matterhorn ride. One of them being a woman named Dolly, who in 1984 fell off of one of the back of the sleds onto the rails. At the time, these gondolas used to go into the rides, and so there was actually a family that watched her fall off onto the track. And so the family also saw as there was another car racing towards Dolly. The dad actually screamed at his daughters to cover their eyes, which was for the best because Dolly got hit hard. She got hit so hard that when EMTs arrived on the scene and were going up into the ride, there were park attendants coming down telling them not to look. And so finally, when someone was looking at the car she was in, they noticed that her seatbelt was unbuckled. But it's never been confirmed if she unbuckled her seatbelt herself or if an attendant didn't check her seatbelt well enough and it was never buckled in the first place. Things that bother you, they never bother me. I I will be showing the video, but nonetheless, hi, my name is Ethan, and here's everything you need to know in under one minute. In September of 2017, 31-year-old Laura Wallen vanished into thin air. Her boyfriend, Tyler Tessier, had played the part of the worried boyfriend desperate for answers. However, he was living a double life. He had a fiance, and he feared that Laura would expose her pregnancy. The night of her unaliving, Laura texted her friend and stated, Tyler has taken me to an open field in Damascus. I'm not sure why we're here, but it's in the middle of nowhere. Her body was found a few days later. Sam and Colby eventually uploaded a video where they were in the same area at the same time and they captured a woman begging for help. Here's the video. What the? Did you get that? Yeah, I got that. Somebody is screaming. Someone screaming bloody murder. Whoa. Guys, what the? You hear that? Yeah. What do you guys think? Have you ever heard of America's first serial killer? Herman Webster moved to Chicago in 1885 and actually ironically changed his name to H.H. H. Holmes after, you guessed it, Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Holmes had quite a bit of medical knowledge, so he opened up a pharmacy near Jackson Park, which actually became the spot of the World's Fair, where he ended up finding a majority of his victims. Holmes purchased an empty lot and turned it into what is known as the Murder Castle. Holmes created this so-called castle with booby traps and a complete labyrinth that made it almost impossible for any of his victims to ever escape. This Murder Castle had soundproof rooms, booby traps, and trap doors that would even drop you unsuspectedly down into the basement. And once you made it into the basement, you never made it back out. Inside the basement was acid vats, quicklime, and a crematorium for him to easily and quickly dispose of any of the bodies. But Holmes finally made a mistake when he murdered his assistant and his few children, but the police actually ended up finding the body of one of these children leading to Holmes' arrest. Once arrested, Holmes claimed to have murdered over 200 people over the span of just a few years inside this murder castle. He even went on to write a book about himself, and in it he wrote, I cannot help that I am a murderer no more than a poet can help the inspiration to sing. Finally, Holmes was hanged for his crimes in 1896. to disgusting individuals. Hi, my name is Ethan, and here's everything you need to know in under one minute. After talking about the Jacqueline Ma case, I wanted to dig a little deeper and see what I could find, and that is when I stumbled upon 36-year-old Randy Cheviera, who also won several teacher awards. Sometime during the fall semester of 2019, she had relations with one of her students. He had later told police that she had performed several non-professional actions on him in the classroom. Police also found out that Randy was texting the student, sending him very explicit messages which also backed up the student's claim. The school was notified on November 18th, 2019, and the next day she resigned and turned herself in. But here's the kicker, she was released one day later. This had to be a horrific way to die. It was just an ordinary day in London, February of 1983, and a plumber named Michael gets a call to go out to a location called Cranley Gardens. The tenants were complaining of a horrible smell, the toilets weren't flushing, the pipes were backed up, so Michael shows up and he removes one of the covers to the drains by the 
outside of one of the houses and he looks down into it and sees a pile of what looks like a slimy flesh-like substance with little pieces of bone sticking out of it and he immediately goes this ain't right so he calls a supervisor supervisor shows up and takes a look and they say uh yeah let's call the police right now and while they were waiting for the police to arrive michael looked at one of the tenants and said that flesh almost looks human and one of the tenants actually replied back to michael and said no nah, it looks like somebody's been flushing their kentucky fried chicken however it was not kentucky fried chicken police arrived on the scene and confirmed that the flesh was in fact human they do a little investigating and realize that the flesh had been being flushed from the top floor. So they go up to the top floor and they knock on the door of a tenant named Dennis Nilsson. Dennis opens the door and the police confront him on the matter and at first he acts completely shocked. But after a little pushing and prodding from the police, Dennis sighs and he goes, it's a long story and it goes back a long time, but I'll tell you everything. I need to get it off my chest anyway. As the police drove to the station with Dennis Nilsson in handcuffs in the back seat, the officers said, so what are we talking about here? One or two bodies down there? How many people did you flush? And Dennis just coolly goes, mm, 15 or 16. As it would turn out, Michael the plumber unknowingly led police to a serial killer who makes the Jeffrey Dahmer story look like a nursery rhyme. And just as Dennis had mentioned earlier, he did have a lot to get off of his chest. He explained that he started out trying to have normal relationships and he didn't want to kill people, it just kind of panned out that way. He would have a relationship here, a relationship there, but they would ultimately always end up leaving him and so he finally found a way to get them to stay. In the 1970s, Dennis had started frequenting gay bars and pubs and luring men back to his apartment with the promise of drinks, and once he got them in there and got them inebriated, he would then proceed to strangle them or drown them. And then once his house guest was dead, he would perform a ritual of cleaning, bathing, shaving, and dressing the bodies, and then posing them in different places around the house, taking photographs, having conversations with the corpses, doing some naughtier things with the corpses, and then ultimately he would stuff the bodies under the floorboards. And he would leave the bodies under the floorboards as long as he possibly could, but ultimately, of course, decomposition would take over, the smell would get to be too much, so he would dismember the bodies, drag it outside, put it in a bonfire, and then mask the smell of burning flesh by putting a car tire on the bonfire. But then Dennis's landlord started remodeling the apartment and actually evicted Dennis. And so Dennis was forced to move into an attic flat where there was no longer access to a piece of land where he could do bonfires. And so he had to start getting creative and find other ways to get rid of the bodies of the people he was killing. And so he began dismembering the bodies into smaller pieces and flushing them down the toilet, which is where our man, Michael the plumber, ultimately unearthed everything that he had been doing. In a short span of five years, Dennis has been confirmed to have killed 12, although he claims to have killed more, and he was guilty of at least seven more attempted murders. He died in prison in 2018. A man named yeah. Peter Porco hops out of bed, uses the bathroom, shaves, puts on a suit, and walks downstairs to eat breakfast. He then prepares his lunch for work that day, loads the dishwasher, writes a check for his son, and then walks outside to go get the morning newspaper. But when the door shuts behind him, he gets locked out. Luckily though, Peter has a spare key hidden in a flower pot on his front porch. He grabs it, unlocks the door, and opens it slowly just to make sure he doesn't wake up his wife, but out of nowhere, he collapses. Dead. Peter and Joan Porco are your typical modest family that live in a two-story home in New York. They have two sons, John, who serves as a naval officer, and Christopher, who's a student at the University of Rochester, 200 miles away. The couple are both in their 50s and have been married for more than 30 years. Peter serves as a court clerk at the Albany Courthouse and is known by his co-workers as a reliable, trustworthy guy. So when he doesn't show up for work on an important court date, everyone becomes a bit concerned. A colleague of his reaches out several times, but Peter never picks up the phone. The co-worker then proceeds to drive to his home to make sure that everything is okay, but when he arrives, there's a crimson trail leading from the walkway up to the doorstep and finally to Peter. First responders arrive at the scene, and that's when they discover Joan Porco lying in the bed. They're shocked to see that she's alive and conscious because it's obvious she has severe head trauma and there are wounds all over her face. Afraid she won't live much longer, a detective looks at Joan and says, Who did this to you? Do you know them? 
She pauses and it's clear she's not able to make out words. She simply nods, yes. The detective then says, was it your son, Chris? And again, she nods, yes. Joan is then rushed to the hospital and after 12 hours of emergency surgery, doctors are able to save her life. However, it's clear that she's not 100%. Joan had received trauma with a blunt object three times to her head, causing the loss of her left eye and a fragment of her skull. It's revealed that the murder weapon is a three-foot axe later found in the couple's bedroom. Peter's autopsy report shows that he was hit 16 times with trauma to the head, face, and body. However, the injuries, which tore off a part of Peter's jaw and exposed a part of his brain, were not the cause of his death. It was the blood loss. See, even after such catastrophic injuries, Peter was still able to get up and go about his day as though nothing happened, surviving for several hours. It's also worth noting that in the past two years, the Porcos had undergone two separate robberies where computers and electronics were stolen from the home. As detectives continue to sift through the evidence surrounding the Porco case, a news reporter makes a call to their son Chris and tells him his parents are dead. He proceeds to call 911 and see if this is actually true and tells police that he was sleeping in the lounge of his college when his mom and dad were attacked. Now keep in mind, Joan identified Chris as her attacker, so detectives start looking for reasons why he'd be motivated to kill his parents. They begin digging into his past to find that his relationship with Joan and Peter was far from perfect. And just two weeks before his murder, Peter Porco had confronted his son Chris about forging his name on a $46,000 check to buy a yellow Jeep Wrangler. Investigators then come across a crucial piece of information. Joan and Peter Porco have a million dollar life insurance policy, half of which is entitled to their son Chris. Three weeks following the grisly ambush of the Porcos, Joan, who is in a medically induced coma, wakes up. And as she starts coming to, she says that she doesn't remember anything about the night of the attack, and even goes on to defend Chris saying that her son would never do such a thing. But his mother's defense isn't enough. The evidence keeps stacking up against Chris, with surveillance cameras from his college showing a yellow jeep leaving campus at 10.30 on the night of the attack. The vehicle returns the following morning at 8.30, and a pair of New York tollbooth operators also report seeing a yellow jeep between the time he left and returned to campus. And when students and staff are asked if they'd seen Chris on the night of his father's murder, no one reports saying that he was sleeping in the lounge of his dorm. Also, if you're still wondering how Peter was able to go about his day with a chunk taken out of his brain, I have your answer. Basically, the paleocortex, the part of the brain responsible for daily tasks, wasn't actually injured during the attack, turning Peter into a real-life zombie, able to go about his day until eventually he bled out and died. A year later, in November 2005, Chris is indicted and his mother, who is still severely disfigured from the attack, manages to scrape together a quarter million dollars for bail and stay with him every day arm in arm until his trial begins in May 2007. Prosecutors argue that from their findings, Chris had manipulated his friends at school, claiming that he was a rich kid, but in reality, he was just a con man. Not only did he regularly steal money from his parents, but he himself was responsible for the two burglaries at the Porco home. He'd pawned the electronics off on eBay because mom and dad had cut him off. And when they cut off Chris for a third time, he, in a fit of rage, drove 300 miles in his stolen Jeep to murder his parents and frame it as though it was just a burglary that had gone wrong. The defense, on the other hand, says that no physical evidence actually ties Chris to the crime scene. However, it's this one detail that proves that Chris Porco is a cold-blooded killer. On the night of the attack, someone had used the family's four-digit passcode to enter the home and turn off the alarm before smashing it. On May 24, 2007, Chris Porco is sentenced to second-degree murder and attempted murder, being sentenced to 50 years in prison. Just how was Chris able to look his mom in her disfigured face and lie to her saying he wasn't the one who did it without feeling an ounce of remorse? A psychologist working on the trial explains this phenomenon best with one word. Sociopath. Did you know that the movie Jaws was inspired by a true story? Well, let's go back in time. Back in the year 1916, between July 1st and 12th of that year, five people were attacked along the coast of New Jersey by sharks, and only one of the victims survived. Let's set the scene. 
It's the middle of the summer along the Jersey Shore. The boardwalk is bustling, the beaches are busy, and the cool ocean water is calling your name. It's Saturday, July 1st at Beach Haven, a resort town on the southern coast of New Jersey. And Charles Epting Van Sant, a 28-year-old man from Philadelphia, was on vacation at the luxurious Angleside Hotel with his family. On that night, just before dinner, Charles decided to take a short swim in the Atlantic Ocean with a dog that he came across on the beach. So, following the dog into the water, Charles jumped in and swam out into the dark ocean waters. A few moments later, Charles' family noticed that he had begun to scream. Fellow bathers in the water believed that Charles was calling out to the dog he had befriended, but the reality of the situation was much darker. Charles was in the midst of a vicious shark attack, and his legs were being ripped apart by a massive beast under the water. After people on the beach and in the water began to realize that Charles was actually being attacked, a lifeguard named Alexander Ott and a bystander named Sheridan Taylor hopped into the water to rescue him. After grabbing a hold of Charles, who was thrashing and screaming, they pulled him ashore. The bystander, Sheridan, would later claim that the bloodthirsty shark followed them in the water all the way up to the beach. At this point, Charles was bleeding profusely as his left thigh was stripped of its flesh, and shortly afterwards, he bled to death on the manager's desk of the Angleside Hotel. This was the first of multiple attacks that would ravage the shore that summer. Despite the brutal attack on Charles Van Sant, kind of like in the movie Jaws, the beaches along the Jersey Shore remained open. And although sea captains who were entering the ports of Newark and New York City reported seeing large sharks swimming off the coast of New Jersey, they were ignored. These captains had tried to warn the public, but no one listened. Fast forward almost a week later to Thursday, July 6, 1916. Spring Lake, New Jersey, 45 miles north of Beach Haven where the first attack occurred, was another beachside community where people from New Jersey came to relax and catch some sun. But on that day, a dark force was waiting out in the waters, preparing to attack. That evening, Charles Bruder, a 27-year-old Swiss bell captain at the Essex and Sussex Hotel, was out on the ocean, swimming 130 yards from the shore. Charles had swam many times in these waters without issue. He knew them like the back of his hand. But that day, while out amongst the waves, a massive shark bit him in the abdomen, tearing apart his insides, and then proceeded to sever both of his legs. According to reports from witnesses, the amount of blood spilling from Charles' mangled body actually turned the water red, like something straight out of a horror movie. After hearing the screams, a woman on the beach notified two lifeguards that a canoe with a red hull had capsized and was floating just at the water's surface. Lifeguards Chris Anderson and George White swiftly rowed out to Charles in a lifeboat, but upon discovering his shredded and lifeless corpse, realized he had been bitten by a shark. Although the lifeguards managed to pull Charles from the water, he was in shock and bleeding profusely and bled to death before he could make it to the shore. According to the New York Times, women were panic-stricken and fainted as Bruder's mutilated body was brought ashore. This was the second brutal shark attack along the Jersey Shore in just under a week, and although panic was beginning to set in, people were still venturing out into the dark waters. A week later, on July 12, 1916, the next two major attacks would take place in the Matawan Creek near the town of Keyport, New Jersey. Keyport is a quaint village located just 30 miles north of Spring Lake where the previous attack had occurred, right near the ocean. Keyport itself resembles more of a Midwestern farm town than a beach resort area, and it was the last place anyone at the time expected another attack to occur. Earlier that day, a man named Thomas Cottrell, a sea captain and Matawan resident, was walking home from work across a bridge in town when he spotted an eight-foot-long shark in the creek heading upstream. Obviously, this was alarming to Thomas, and he rushed into town and attempted to tell locals what he had seen in an attempt to warn them. But sadly, the people of Keyport and Matawan dismissed his warnings, citing that he must have been suffering from heat stroke, and no effort was made to tell people to stay out of the water. So now we get to around 2 o'clock p.m. that afternoon. A group of local boys, including Lester Stilwell, age 11, were playing in Matawan Creek together, near a dock called the Wickoff Dock. It was an average summer day. It was hot, the sun was shining, and the kids just wanted to cool off in the water. One of the boys had brought along his pet dog, which was swimming with them as well. While swimming near Wakeoff Dock, the boys claimed they saw what appeared to be an old black weather-beaten board or a weathered log, but they brushed it off as nothing. Lester told his friends to take a look at him as he floated on his back in the water, but as he was floating, he was suddenly and violently pulled beneath the water by a massive shark. Lester's friends were helpless and had no idea what to do as they watched their friend violently being thrashed up and down in the creek as Lester's screams filled the air and his blood filled the water. One boy noticed a dorsal fin poking out of the creek, and it was then when they finally realized that Lester was being attacked by a shark. Immediately, the boys got out of the creek and ran to town for help, screaming that their friend Lester was being attacked, and several men, including Watson Stanley Fisher, a local 24-year-old businessman, rushed to help. 
At first, the adults thought that Lester had been suffering from a seizure and that the boys had imagined the dorsal fin, so they hopped into the water to try locate Lester's body. Quickly though, they realized they were dead wrong. Stanley Fisher, the businessman, was quickly able to find Lester's body under the water, but as he was pulling it up from the bottom of the creek, the shark attacked him as well, ripping into his leg. It was a crazy and chaotic scene, and in the process, Stanley lost Lester's body and it floated back down into the depths. Stanley's heroism had led him right into the mouth of the beast as well. After emerging from the creek, the townspeople realized that Stanley's right thigh had been severely injured and stripped of its flesh, and he would later bleed to death at Monmouth Memorial Hospital in Long Branch at 5.30 p.m. that afternoon. Lester's body was recovered two days later, 150 feet upstream from the Wickoff Dock area on July 14, 1916. But the shark wasn't done that day. The fifth and final victim, Joseph Dunn, a 14-year-old boy from New York City, was attacked half a mile upstream from the Wickoff Dock nearly 30 minutes after the fatal attacks on Lester and Stanley. At the time, Joseph and his friends were swimming in the same Matawan Creek and had yet to hear about the vicious attack that had just unfolded a few hundred feet up the river. The group was still in the water when someone from town ran down to them, yelling at them that they needed to get out of the water because there was a massive bloodthirsty shark somewhere lurking within its depths. Hearing this, Joseph, his friend, and his brother swam to the dock and began to get out of the creek. But just as Joseph was climbing up the ladder to escape the water, the man-eating shark sprung from the creek and chomped down on his left leg. Joseph screamed, and his brother and friend rushed over to help pull him from the shark's jaws, and after a vicious tug-of-war battle with the shark, they managed to pull Joseph out of the water and saved his life. Joseph Dunn was then taken to St. Peter's University Hospital in New Brunswick, where he eventually recovered from the attack, although he lost his leg. After these attacks, the public was in a full-blown panic. Even President Woodrow Wilson got involved and assigned funds specifically to the New Jersey government to help identify and eliminate the shark threat. All across New Jersey and New York, beaches were patrolled by heavily armed guards on boats. Gates were built in the water near the beaches and entire communities were shut down. This story was front page news across the entire nation and everyone was scared to get into the water. In Matawan specifically, where Joseph, Lester, and Stanley were attacked in the creek, a reward of over $2,000 was offered to anyone who could catch and kill a shark in the creek. Residents of Keyport and Matawan patrolled the shoreline for days, firing shotgun rounds into the water and even detonating dynamite in the creek. However, no shark was ever killed or captured in the area. The nickname given to this killer creature would eventually take a hold of the nation, the Matawan Maneater. Multiple people claimed to have captured and killed the man-eater in the following weeks, but one specific case sticks out amongst others. On July 14th, two days after the attacks in the creek, a man named Michael Schleiser was out on a boat in Raritan Bay, the body of water that feeds into the Matawan Creek, only a few miles from the scene of the attacks. As he was on the water, a great white shark attacked his boat. The boat was sinking, and Michael took action and managed to kill the shark with a broken oar before it could kill him. When the shark's stomach was cut open and analyzed, scientists found suspicious fleshy material and bones, and it was eventually determined that the young great white had previously ingested nearly 15 pounds of human flesh, and thus the man-eater story came to an end. There were no more shark attacks on the Jersey Shore that summer, and to this day, they remain far and few. But scientists still don't have a clear answer to the question, what was the Matawan man-eater? The general consensus at the time, and to this day, was that the shark was a great white. Others suggest that it was a bull shark, as they're most commonly found in creeks and rivers and are known to be aggressive. But we decided to go pay Matawan, New Jersey a visit so that we could check out the locations of these brutal attacks ourselves and search for some of our own answers to our questions. So